here is how I set goals so that I can actually hit them. And this is coming from some guy who is, you know, frankly, pretty lazy. And, um, you know, I yeah. don't, um, I'm not like you, like, I'm not like, oh, I need to, to lose weight. I must have a 500 calorie deficit. Therefore it is done. I will now like, you know, track this thing that always felt like too much work to me, but let me tell you what does work for me. Um, by the way, first it's the exact first. opposite. It's less work to do it that way because then you don't think. You just like do. You just do what it you're supposed to do. It's a classic thing that somebody who has discipline and willpower says. Like, oh, it's easier <laughs> to just do it right the first time. Yeah, we know, bro. If we and we know that that's true, we just don't live life that way. Like, it's okay. You know, I, I speak from the procrastinator's perspective. All right, you want to tell us about this game or what? Well, first of all, I think we need to spice up the intro. I think the intro needs to be like right now we're just casual with it. We just come on like it's just a conversation and people love that. They love the authenticity. But you know what? You know what works when you become a cheese ball and you just start performing and make it a show and you give a proper intro and you do all the things. This is My First Million, the podcast that has two future trillionaires that come at you. Oh, by the way, did you see this? Did you, did you see this guy who went on LinkedIn and then quoted the Manifest Cowboys thing? <laughs> Wait, whoa, what happened? I, I tagged you in it. Some guy was he's telling you a story. Use LinkedIn? Oh, bro, I'm going ham on LinkedIn right now. Are you really? Uh, Why? Just, Wait, like, what do you mean? Like trying to get so popular? I told you I hired that content remixer guy, Brandon. And so Brandon has been amazing. What he does, is he just takes my old good tweets. He posts them on LinkedIn and people on LinkedIn, bro, it's a gun to a knife fight. They're like, wow, incredible content. This is fan wow, what a conversation. This is stimulating. Cause you know, LinkedIn is like the most boring content farm generically. Right. So like I've been over here fighting on Twitter against like, you know, fucking professional tweeters who are researching eight hours a day and like creating these like epic threads. And, you know, I just come off the dome, bro. Like, you know, I, I, I'm that painting at the top of the Sistine Chapel. I'm just off the top. And now I bring that to LinkedIn and it's a whole new, it's a habanero pepper for them. And so it's a ghost pepper. It's the last wing on hot ones and they don't know what to do with it. And so this guy has been posting. So I just get to check the, um, the notifications and I'll be like, Oh shit. He posted that thing from like a year ago that I said, and people on LinkedIn are loving it. But today it, I go it's getting on, popular. Yeah. I think I added like, I don't know, a thousand followers this week or something like that. Dude, <laughs> I, I by even, the way, I, I knew this woman named Candace. You maybe knew her too. And she was an entrepreneur and she owned a bikini company. And she was like, you know what? I'm just going to start. This was in 2000. Uh, 15, 16, 17. She goes, I'm going to start posting like stories about our bikini business and like, you know, how things are going. And so it like, it, like new product updates, whatever. And it was all like, you know, hot ladies in bikinis, you know, like right. big boobs and, and stuff. It was looked great. Like what the algorithm, it went, it went crazy. <laughs> it broke people's brain and she eventually got banned and she obviously did the right thing of like making a, a public fuss about it. It's like, what? I'm just talking about my business. What's wrong with this? This is professional content. I sell bikinis. I've got, and so it worked awesomely for her. And so I think that if you have a business that is like uh, related to something like, you know, like that, you can kill it on LinkedIn. But anyway, so you're crushing it on LinkedIn right now? Yeah. So this guy, yeah, this guy, Thomas Angel, I'll give him a shout out. He, um, he posted, he goes, it says, quote, I don't do business. I manifest. Hashtag MFM. <laughs> and then he goes, yeah, Sprouts Farmer's Market was number one on our vision board when we launched our, the everything latte at Altitude Fun Functional Beverages. I guess that's his company, Altitude Functional Beverages. So he goes, after 13 months, we're now in 10 stores, blah, blah, blah. We're great. We're great. We're great. And he goes, thank you to the OGs. Hashtag manifest cowboys. And then he tagged us. In it. And I totally forgot you had said that on the last pod. And I was like, wow. That is incredible. Manifest Cowboys is one of your top five uh, little creations. <laughs> and like, I just feel like we need to go all in on the only podcast featuring two trillionaires, the Manifest Cowboys, <laughs> the men who never age, haven't seen a wrinkle in my life, same body fat as your milk, 2%. Like, that's how we need to go. And then we say, hey, iTunes. Play that back. Fifteen. Go back fifteen seconds. Play that again. <laughs> <laughs> Did you make up that two percent nonsense? That's beautiful. Again, off the top, I told you I'm good early in the morning. We just we moved our podcast to an early morning recording, and I just have like an extra ten percent juice 
early in the morning where I'm a little crazy. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, I'm I just roll out of bed and these are the thoughts in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, you're like a rapper right now. You're just keep, you keep rhyming. I well, like I saw, this. I saw this hilarious clip of um, it's actually my favorite form of marketing is you take a clip from something else. So you've seen this one where it's a bar and they're wa- the whole bar is watching something on a big screen. And it's like the, the original clip was like from the World Cup and like the guy scores a oh, goal and, you, and, the and bar, he puts something on there. Just, yeah. And you just put whatever on there. Right. Like I'll put like the milk too. road, the milk road like shows up in your inbox. Like, you know, the, the email pops up and then the crowd just goes crazy. And so I saw a version of that. Somebody did it with Joe Rogan. It's Joe Rogan talking to, to somebody. And he's like, have you seen this? And then the guy's like, no. He's like, pull that up. And then they just replace it with this TikTok of this young chubby white boy rapping. And he's really horrible, but it's hilarious. <laughs> and he's like dancing and rapping at the same time. And Joe's like, God, how do they do it? And like they show the reaction, but they've spliced it together. <laughs> and uh, I saw one of those. And so that just really you know, made my morning. I spent so many hours in the morning and at night just scrolling through Instagram and TikTok and just laughing constantly at all these. Just young people are so funny now. I don't think... When I was younger and like that age doing stuff like this, no one was this funny. Like the amount of funny people is it's it's way higher now. Me and my sister, we send each other maybe she says me like 25 TikToks a day. I send back maybe 10. And like the caption on each one isn't like it's not like, oh, you got to watch this. Oh, this is really funny. Or uh, ah, that's so true. It's every every like seven lines. She's just like, people are too good. Like, wh- how, are, <laughs> how are they so talented? Like, yeah. because TikTok is the greatest talent show ever created. It's America's Funniest Home Video every hour on the hour, right? It's like, it is this giant talent show. And when you watch it, you're like, I am nothing compared to yeah. these people. I am, <laughs> I am I the, the dirt on their shoe. They scrape me off before they walk into their house. Like, you feel so dumb. Um and I, I just like I can't I don't understand how they come up with these, how they film them, like where the where the inspiration comes from. It's too good. It's so good. And the subreddit, the fighter and the kid that you and I like, just like the commenters are so funny. It's like every every top comic. It's like one of the best jokes done by a comedian that I like. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, it's, exactly. it, like it's like that's how high caliber it is. I just. And it's almost like the way that I describe it, it's like, it doesn't matter if you're into the outdoors or not. When you see a big mountain, you're like, oh, wow, that's epic. You know, like you appreciate the right. epicness. That's how I feel like when I watch TikTok. I'm like, I don't even like this thing that they're talking about. But how on earth did someone come up with this? And it's just that over and over and over again. And I'm in awe. I'm in awe constantly. Yeah. People talk about how uh, these things are a waste of time. Uh, I don't know what their TikTok feed is like. My TikTok feed is incredible. It is the most entertainment per second I've ever experienced in my life. It is funny. It is like insightful. I'll learn stuff all the time. Little life hacks, how stuff works. Uh, I'm watching a TikTok about like, you know, how a a farmer like, you know, farm squash. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. Right. Like I'm just learning stuff that I didn't even know I wanted to know because I would never click the YouTube video. But bro, if I go on YouTube now, it's like, you know, you know, when you go to a city and they're like, uh, you know, there's like by the tourist destination, they're like, oh, you want to get on this horse carriage? You know, it'll make for a funny picture. And like, you know, it's a romantic date and you got to like do this old, slow, uncomfortable thing because uh, I might as well, you know, you got to do something different. Life's too good now. That's how I feel when I go on YouTube. Like I'm getting back on the <laughs> horse carriage after I've experienced like an F1 car. And right. uh, I don't know how YouTube's going to survive. Dude, speaking of like this type of stuff, speaking of like, uh, uh, entertainment and like doing epic shit. I'm reading this book about this woman named Elsbeth, Elspeth Beard. That's an interesting name. And in 1979 or 1980, I think she was 22 years old and she's just like says, fuck it, I'm going to ride my motorcycle around the country or uh, sorry, around the world, around the globe. So like you like get on a ship and go to America, ride it all across America, get on a ship on the other side, go to whichever continent is on the other Did side of California. Do this? Is this just I your female a- pen name? Dude, I did it across America, which is soft. That's soft. Like there's a McDonald's every 50 miles. You know, she did it like in Iran and shit. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like there, there's levels to this game. And she did it in 1979. And so like she was like, we couldn't even get maps. But anyway, I was reading it and I was like, I'm such a pussy. 
Like, why why don't we live more? Ep do we do we need to live more epic, adventurous lives? She did this thing at age 22, and now she's like 65. She's still giving talks on about it and making money because we are all so weak and we refuse to do like these interesting. It's not that hard <laughs> nowadays to ride a motorcycle across the world. It's not that hard. You take six <laughs> months, you buy a twenty thousand dollar BMW. It ain't gonna break. You use your iPhone. It ain't hard. But I just a thought it was interesting that she did this thing at age 22. It's kind of like whenever I like see people like um. Whenever I see like the Rolling Stones perform, I'm like, this motherfucker's 80 years old and he's playing a song that he wrote when he was 18. That's longevity. That's good. That, and that's like kind of what she's doing. So I'm like amazed that you could do one thing at a young age and live off of it forever. And B, we're soft, man. We got to do more epic stuff. Like we're just sitting in our houses all the time doing this lame stuff all the time. We got we to gotta be more adventurous, right? What would you do? I've always wanted to walk across America. So I would do that. I've already ridden my motorcycle across America. I've driven across America a bunch of times. I think I could drive my motorcycle across All right. What was the world. genuinely hard? So not like, um, it sounds hard, but what genuinely was hard? I, um, with, with riding a motorcycle across the country, it no, was no, easy, just man. In it, general, other stuff you've done, Any, anything you've done. What's the actual thing that you've like, that's been really hard? Doing an Ironman, that was like legitimately hard. Like I felt pain. I think it'd be fun to like ride a bicycle or something like that across America. And I think that would be genuinely tough, like physically and emotionally tough. I did an Ironman and that was like legitimately hard. I felt like I was in pain for almost the entire time. It sucked. Dude, so uh, Ramon and Suli, they they texted me. Ramon was like, guys, we got to do this Ironman in Hawaii He's an next idiot. year. I'm signing us up. And like he caught me when I was in that when I had that trillionaire two percent body fat energy, and I just oh, two words all caps I'm in. Did and you really say that? He literally Did was you even typing, know how to ride a bike. No, he was typing his speech bubbles, <laughs> and I just I just responded. I go, I go, Ramon, say no more. And then he stopped typing <laughs> in the iMessage. Okay, three hours. He booked passed. it. He booked it, didn't it? Three hours pass. Yeah, he starts sending me like. PDF ticket reservations. He starts sending me stuff. I'm like, and I now realize what I have done. And I realize your boy's not as hard as he thinks. He's not <laughs> as tough as he thinks. He's not as in as he thought he was in. And do you even fact, know how to swim? Have you ever swam before? I have a 15 foot pool and I can swim in it, but I have never, <laughs> it's like a one mile free, like an ocean freestyle swim. <laughs> just to start the race <laughs> and, and so i go and so I, then i had to backtrack so i just came quick i go um hey i've seen the first one but can't wait for the second one they go what iron man right that's what we're talking about the movie <laughs> <laughs> he goes no bro you're not getting out of this and i go no i am and then he's and that's i didn't have a reason and then he's so then every day he's been texting me like Hey, here's this cool link to how to train. And I'm like, I'm not opening that link. Cause if I open that link, there's no, if I know what it, what it entails, there's no way I'm going to do this. So I was guilted into do this by him. And I trained for six months and I did pretty good. I did all right. And yeah. he got last. And you're very, very fit. And you're saying it's hard. If I trained was my hard. hardest for a year, I would not be as fit as you were before you trained for your Ironman. I would be the before photo. And so it doesn't make sense. And so then I just told him, I go, if I don't talk to you anymore, I don't have to do it. And so I just stopped responding to him. And we'll see if this Just for the listeners so they know how stupid, like it was like the Three Stooges. We went down there and I trained. I, I, I was a division one athlete. I trained, I did fine, I was great. But they, and I hired a coach. I did everything the right way. These freaking <laughs> idiots who we went with, they bought, <laughs> they bought the bike the day before when they were down there. And like the, the night before you set your bike up at the place and they leave it there. And Suli and Ramon were like, hey, so how do we use those pedals with that attached to your feet? We bought them. How do we use them? <laughs> they were like setting it up there. <laughs> and Suli, this other guy who we went with, he did the swim. He did the entire thing in backstroke because he didn't know how to <laughs> swim with his head underneath the water. <laughs> and they assigned a kayaker lifeguard to him because they were so afraid that he was going to drown. I swear to God. And but they, he finished. Of, he did it. Of all the 9,000 people there, I'm not exaggerating. They got literally last place. Last. <laughs> and like 9,000. Yeah. 9,000. 
<laughs> and they were miserable. And then the next day they're like, this is sick, bro. You want to do it again? <laughs> like, it, it, it was the craziest shit on earth. These guys are idiots. They also asked me if I, if I wanted to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro with them. And uh, I was like, no, no, I'm out. No, I do not want to do that. I'm, yeah, the I'm problem not is they're like, I don't know, seven to 10 years older than us. So they're like in a midlife crisis and we're getting dragged into their <laughs> midlife fighting against father time, uh, you know, thing. And now we are doing these things as well. You know, so actually this is a topic I wanted to talk about, which is how to set goals. I think you had something on your thing about I wrote setting something goals. about that. Yeah. So let's talk about this. So I, I don't know what you wanted to do, but I had this idea of what is your approach to setting and hitting goals? Is that what you were going to say? Yeah. Well, let me like go on a little rant here. So I've been doing this thing called intro. You know, that intro thing, like you just like talk to people and it's actually really fun. That's why I do it. I do it from Friday at 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Oh, just really? Two hours. So if they just turned off the money, you do it because it's so fun. No, I am doing it because it's fun <laughs> and I get paid uh, $2,000 an hour. Obscene amounts of money. <laughs> yeah. So it, both. It is, it is, it's fun money, envelope money. Um, and I've been doing this and a question that I ask people constantly and they never rarely have answers to, and they act like I'm like profound for asking this. I'm like, dude, this is like table stakes, which is what does success look like in five years? Like specifically, like if this is a money thing, like how much money do you want? How much revenue, how many users, whatever. And what I've learned, and then I've been working with some family members and they're like, want to get their finances in order. And I'm like, all right, well, how much do you spend every month? How much do you want to spend every month? And then let's work back from how much income you think you need. And I think the vast majority of people, they don't write shit down. And so I did this one intro call with this guy and I was like, hey, so here's this app that I used for a long time. It's called My Weekly Budget. You just Every time you spend a cent, just write it down and just do it for uh, four weeks and then just look back at how much you spend. And like, oh, I never thought about that. And he messaged me and he goes, I've been writing this down for like two weeks. I had no idea I was spending this and that and this. I've been saving thousands of dollars now that I know. And I do the same thing with weight loss. I say, I want to weigh this much weight. Therefore, I have to burn. I can only eat 2,100 calories and I'm just going to write down whatever I eat. Um, just writing things down, both goals as well as like the things that you're doing. So you kind of like have an idea is the easiest way to get to where you want to go without really changing a significant amount of your behavior. You have you noticed that? I have noticed that. Yes. And I do that. I think I think a lot of people think they do that. But let me go into a little more detail on some sh some stuff I do that I think is maybe a little bit different. All right. So I'm going to give you a couple bullet points. Here is how I set goals so that I can actually hit them. And this is coming from some guy who is, you know, frankly, pretty lazy. And, um, you know, I yeah. don't, um, I'm not like you. Like, I'm not like, oh, I need to, to lose weight. I must have a 500 calorie deficit. Therefore, it is done. I will now like, you know, track this thing. That always felt like too much work to me. But let me tell you what does work for me. Um, By the way, it's the exact first, opposite. It's less work to do it that way because then you don't think. You just like do. You just do what you're supposed to do. It's a classic thing that somebody who has discipline and willpower says. Like, oh, it's easier <laughs> to just do it right the first time. Yeah, we know, bro. If we and we know that that's true, we just don't live life that way. Like, it's okay. You know, I, I speak from the procrastinator's perspective. All right, so here's some things that I do that do work for me. First is, and you tell me if you do this or not. I set picture goals or movie scene goals, not just written goals. So, for example. Uh, sometimes it's hard for me to figure out, like, let's say it's a financial goal. Okay. How much money do I want and when? And then I kind of like, I'll pick a number. I'll be like, is that too high? Is that too low? And I got to make it real in some way. So sometimes what I'll do is if it's a number goal, I'll do the math to add it up. I'll be like, okay, here's how I want to live. I want to spend this, 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 and this, what does that actually come out to? And I'll go bottoms up to create the goal or I'll just simplify it. I'll be like, I don't know. Numbers and logic is a little too hard to understand. I'll go on Zillow. And I'll just find the picture of the house I want. I'll be like, this, this is my goal. And I could just look at that picture of that house. And it has a whole feeling and a whole like set of assumptions that if I was living in that house, like life is pretty good. That is my motivating goal. Like I'm more motivated by a picture or a little movie scene in my head than I am by just this like kind of written text that it, it requires my brain to do a bunch of like work to try to like make life out of this, out like of a these, vision out board. Of this text. Yeah, I do it. Yeah, I guess I just described a vision board. Okay, cool. So uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's the first thing. <laughs> Pinterest. Yeah, great idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. It's touche. like an Uber, but, <laughs> but for kids. One, yeah, Sean Uber. Zero. Okay, let's, let's keep going. Second thing I do, floor goals and ceiling goals. So I don't set one goal. I set a range. The floor goal that I'll set for any project 
is like, all right, at a minimum, this is like the minimum that it would take for it to feel like a win. And so I just will write that down. I'll be like, all right, this is the minimum goal. And because, and what, what, what was happening was normally I was writing a goal. Then I'd be like, kind of beat myself up. Like I'm not ambitious enough. So I need to set a more audacious goal. So I set a bigger goal, bigger goal, bigger goal. And then I would like, you know, inevitably like sort of under deliver on that. And now I'd have to like, basically I'd either be disappointed because I didn't reach my like super ambitious goal, but still clearly a good thing happened. Or I would have my super ambitious goal and secretly in my head, I'd have like my backup goal that like I wouldn't right. tell anybody because it wasn't so cool. But like I knew logically that that was good. So then I just started writing it down. Here's the floor. Here's the ceiling. Ceiling is uh, the, the, the F. Yeah. Like what would make me say F. Yeah, that really worked out. Um, and so like uh, I get, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example after this. But all right, the floor and the ceiling goal. That's the next one. Do you do anything like that? Like a range? No, but that's a good idea. I just. No, I just like put the maybe I kind of do. I, I say, here's what I think will happen. But then I say in the best case scenario, I think this might happen, but I'm not expecting that. Right. That's how I started this podcast. I was like, the floor goal is if I just invite a bunch of cool guests on. Well, I'll probably like if I do one of these a week, 52 guests, let's say half of them are cool. Let's say half of those cool people become kind of like buddies or friends or, you know, we, we like each other. Cool. So I'll make like maybe 12, 15 new friends that are like kind of heavy hitters enough where I could invite them on a podcast. I was like, that's a win. That alone is a win. It's enough to like do this, do this podcast for, 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 you know, once a week. And so that was my floor goal. My ceiling goal was, well, what if people actually listen to this? Wouldn't that be sweet if people would, you know, on their commutes and they, they would listen to this and, and, you know, we'd have this big audience of people who like, listen and trust us. That would be amazing. Right. And well, so I do now, it with, I, I use that methodology for risk taking. So I say, should I quit my job and start this company? Well, the worst case scenario is that it's going to take me six months to find a new job. Therefore, I'll have six months of savings lined up. And if I just so happen to build a successful company, that's gravy. That's awesome. But this, but I just basically I'm taking the risk that I'm going to I just I'm assuming that I'm, I'm going to find a new job and have six months of savings. Great. That's my baseline. I'm fine right. with that. So floor and ceiling. That's the second part. Um, okay. Goals and anti goals. So I stole this from Andrew Wilkinson who stole it from somebody else probably, but, uh, it's really easy to set a goal and not acknowledge some of the common trappings you could get, even if you accomplish your goal, simple example, um, in college, my buddy dated this girl, her dad was like a partner at a big consulting firm and he was a partner. He guy would make you know a million, $2 million a year. Probably he was, he made it to the top of his like on top of that ladder. But also he was, you know, all every single week he would fly out Monday through Thursday. He would come back Friday, be there Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He would leave again Sunday night and he was just gone for like half of her life growing up. And so that's an example of achieving your goal, but maybe hitting an anti goal as well, which was he probably didn't plan and set out to say, I don't want to see my family. You know, my kid growing up for the first 18 years of life, I'm only going to be there half the time but it just kind of came as a byproduct of trying to hit their goal. So now I set out specific anti goals like, Oh yeah, I want to do this podcast, but I don't want it to feel like a bunch of work every week. Right? Like I'm not trying to make this my job. I want this to be a fun hobby. Right? And so I, w an anti goal might be all of a sudden I'm drowning in work, trying to edit this thing and upload the thumbnail and write the show notes and do all this stuff. That would be an anti goal. If the, if the after pod recording took five hours a week or, uh, you know, 10 hours a week to go to produce it. And so by identifying the anti-goal up front, you can make a game plan that that solves it. Do you do that? I do it a little bit differently. I don't call it an anti-goal. No, I say, here's what here's the price I'm willing to pay to achieve the thing I want to achieve. So, for example, when I was I said, um, when I'm going to start this company, The Hustle, I told my wife, I go, when we were dating, I go, just so you know, the business is going to come first for the next handful of years, because then when we get married and have kids, I'll have more time for that. But like right now, business is first and I'm going to give up vacations. I'm going right. to give up. The price I'm willing to pay is we're just not going to have that much time together unless if the business gets in the way. Right. Baby, tell me again, uh, who's number one on my priority list? The business. <laughs> yeah. That's right, baby. Say it again. It. Say it again. Say yeah. it again. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. Yeah, tell me. <laughs> it's Valentine's Day. Who's my date? The hustle. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You got it. You got it. You understand. <laughs> I have to confirm. You got to double opt into this shit. <laughs> So right. I always say, here's the thing I'm willing to get. I'm this. This is the price I'm paying. 
You know what I'm saying? You want right. to look good naked. The price, price. you got to yeah. You you want to look good in the nude. The price you got to pay is you got to eat this crap chicken and like not have fun there. You know you got to pay right. a price. Right. Um, I like that. All right. The next one in your face daily. So now we're on number four. We we painted the picture. That's kind of the mood board, the movie see, scene, the floor and ceiling method, the goal and anti goal method, and now in your face daily. This is one where I think a lot of people make a mistake. They write down the goal at the moment they're motivated and inspired, and they they read that book, they watched that video. You know, they got their pen and paper out. They write it down. Then they close the book and then they just go back onto autopilot for the next like 17 days and they can't even revisit their, they don't revisit their goal. So my big thing is I need to see it daily, right? The goal is like the barista, you know, if I'm going to get coffee before work every day, I'm going to see this face. I'm going to see my goals face every single day. And so I will set this up in Slack. I will set up, I'll just use the remind uh, function. I'll say, remind me every day that my goal this week is for Milk Road to add this many subscribers or to go viral with one post on Twitter or to, you know, um, to chase down that investment that I'm really bullish about and make sure we get in this round. And I will set that reminder so that it pops up every single day. And it's only me who sees that, but now I do that with my team. At the end of every, uh, you know, either daily or weekly, I will repost the goals that we had for the week and just be like, you know, here it is. Make sure you keep this top of mind or as my next, my next method is, the tip of your tongue test, which is <laughs> if you can't say what you want, if it's not at the tip of your tongue, what you're going for, you, you're you not clear enough about it. And like you are not giving yourself the best chance to succeed because you can't articulate your goal at the tip of your tongue. Ben, can I can I pick on you for a second? Ben, are you there? I know he's like in the, at the beach, so he may not have the best uh, audio video. I, I got kicked out of my last spot. I can I can try. OK, try Ben. With your podcast, How to Take Over the World, what is the goal? The goal is to be a top 100 podcast overall uh, in, in the a Apple podcast ratings. Okay, sounds good. Sam, critique that real quick. He's missing one critical element. Do you know what it is? It, probably the input. The input meaning what? Uh, like, you, you, I think for goal setting, it's probably a little bit easier to be input oriented so like what you're willing like i'm what gonna you're, do x i'm gonna do x you know because you can't exactly control the output so like be more input oriented i would also probably say if, if for podcast i would put a download number on it but i don't know what do you think right or a time box right like by when oh a time box right? yeah by uh, when do you have 10 years to do this or one year to do this that's a critical element to a goal is to be it from it, it should be pass fail like it should be easy to figure out did this happen or not and if you don't have a time box you can't you can't ever judge it right so Sean do you have your do you have your computer open yeah go to my twitter handle and what's my bio say uh, i have go. made this for the past uh oh. month or two and it's been working wonderfully and it's exactly what you're talking about oh perfect you go i own the hustle sold it to hubspot i tweet about this i do the podcast and then you said losing another 5 pounds this month parentheses august Yes, I always whatever the, the goal is, I put it up there in Twitter. Right. So I see it every day. And the thing that you didn't mention that I love doing is I love shaming myself. I love <laughs> shame. I think shame and rage are the two best fuel to like get something done that people <laughs> never talk about. I, I like I still do things to make Aaron Coyne, my eighth grade girlfriend, angry. Like I'm still in my head, I'm like, what's gonna prove her wrong? You know what I mean? Like, how am I gonna win and like prove that she was wrong for breaking up with me? So I think rage is awesome, but I think like shaming yourself or like guilting yourself where you put it publicly and you have to do it. The other thing that I do constantly that works wonderfully is you have to like set appointments or put something on the table. So for example, I, I have these, a couple bad tattoos I wanna get fixed and I've been wanting to do it. I've been so lazy. You just, you gotta make the appointment. You make the appointment. It's like, fuck, I can't bail. I already put down money on this thing. Like I have to right. do this. You know what I mean? And I think that those totally. things really, really help. Yeah, like my Iron Man competition coming up. But um, Shame and Rage, uh, that's a pretty good, I mean, My First Million's a good name. Shame and Rage would have been a great name for this podcast. <laughs> Dude, Shame and Rage is such a good fuel. I don't know, like people say, like, you don't be angry. I'm like, no, fuck that. Anger, I love anger. I love anger. Anger gives me so much goodness. Like, I, I'm still, like, what is the phrase? Chips on shoulders, put chips in pockets. I love anger. Anger is such a good, uh, a, a good uh, emotion to drive you. I used to do that. I used to, I used to have a, a thing that I've taken off this list, which was use your own psychology against you. 
So it'd be like, oh, if I state publicly what I'm going to do, then I feel the pressure to go ahead and do it. Or like, yeah, if I use kind of insecurity or anger, that could be like a fantastic fuel for accomplishing my goals. Uh, but I don't I personally don't do that anymore because it makes the process of doing the thing kind of unpleasant. Uh, it is effective for hitting the goal. But well, that's uh, because you have this not, really not big problem. You've got a huge problem. You know what your too problem happy. is? I'm too you are emotionally stable and happy. <laughs> yeah, you've got that's a really big issue in your life is you're just too emotionally stable. Um, so, you know, like, I'm sorry that your parents were wonderful to you, but that's just the price you have to pay. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Sam goes around to his house, just like shaving half an inch off every table. Just trying to yeah. get it to have a little bit of instability in it. He's like, this is better. <laughs> I want the plates to slide, yeah. baby. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had the advantage of, you know, having a, a problematic childhood. You, 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 you have, were disadvantaged by having a perfect little life. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history. Calls, support tickets, emails, and... Here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot, grow better. All right, I'm going to finish my goal thing real quick. I got three more. All right, last three, the most important three are uh, I don't move unless I actually believe that it's going to happen. Yeah. So a lot of people will say, and I would say, Ben, I, 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 you don't have to come back on, but people will say things like Ben just said, and I would say at least half the time, if they are honest with themselves, I want to be a top 100 podcast in the world by you know by you know in, in 12 months if i said what do you what do you think are the odds that that's going to happen they'll be like well it is you know hard and it is risky you know but, and they'll sort of like the, if it comes down to it their belief that it's actually going to happen is quite low and i don't let myself move unless i actually believe that it's going to happen because there's this like there's a virtuous and vicious cycle belief drives action. If I really believe that some shit's going to work, if I really believe that this person's going to say yes and buy my product, I will pick up the phone immediately and call them. It's only when I don't believe they're going to buy my product that I, I'm like, well, I'll call them after I finish this PowerPoint day. I'm going to actually, you know, Friday's not a good day to call because of this. And hold, hold on, let me just go clean my room real quick, you know, because that's, you know, I, I just want to get that done. Then I'm going to be a better headspace. Like, it's your belief that drives the level of action you're going to take. Like massive belief equals massive action. Massive action equals a good result. And a good result reinforces the belief. This is also what happens to people who become have a lack of confidence. They don't believe. Therefore, they take timid action. Timid action creates shitty results. And that just reinforces to them. They're like, see, I knew it wasn't like I kind of knew it wasn't. I knew it was right. going to be too hard. I knew, I knew this wasn't like the odds were against us. And then it just happens again and again. So I don't move until I, I work myself into a spot where my belief is super high. Um, last two, baby goals or giggle steps. So I've kind of learned that like if you have a big goal, you got to set a baby goal or a giggle step. A giggle step is a step that is... that a is, trademark? Giggle step and just a tip are your two I met, no, so I met far. this woman and she, she created this uh, phrase. She was like, hey, you know that book... Uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear. I was like, yeah, yeah. She's like, it's it's all right. And I was like, oh, you mean like the best selling book that's like you yeah. know, sold like three million copies this year, like one of the greatest self help books, you know, in the last decade in terms of sales. She's like, yeah, it's okay, but it's missing the most important thing. I was like, what is it? She goes, he's he got it kind of right that you need to set like a simple <laughs> first step, but it's even his is way too hard. Like if you want to set a habit to floss your teeth every day, you actually want to start with something so simple, it would make you giggle because it's so not a goal that it's achievable and you'll actually do it. And so she's like, so all you would do if you wanted to floss your teeth every day is literally put one piece of floss, floss next to your bathroom and like next to your sink and just floss a single tooth and then put it down and walk away. And it's like, oh, what's that going to do? A single tooth? And it's like, it'll literally make you laugh. It takes away a lot of the fear and the built up like scariness of it going down this endeavor. Who's this? Who's this lady? Uh, I hate that I forgot her name now, um, but Oof. yeah, I met her, I think at Betsy, Betsy something. I got to find her last name. I don't remember her last name. <laughs> that sounds made up so far. And it also <laughs> might not be her first name and I might be the <laughs> worst person in the world, but like Giggle Steps is good. Um, Ben, see if you can Google that and pull up her, pull up her full name. I've only met her twice. Um, okay. Last one is, uh, last one is you got to revise up 
or abort down. So I think what a lot of people do is as things get hard, they start to compromise the goal and they'll start revising it down, 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 down to the point where it's not even motivating anymore. It's like you, you sort of took the edge off the goal. And yeah, now you kind of don't fail, but you also don't really succeed. And so my rule is I either revise up, meaning I, oh shoot, I think this could be even bigger, right? This podcast we've revised up. It's now bigger than I thought it could be. And so now I've revised up. Okay. It can actually be, you know, X millions of listeners every month. Um, hell, we're already at, you know, one point something, 1 1.3, 1 1.5, something like that million per month. Why can't this be? By the way, last month, month, last month we were at 1.7, I think. Yeah, exactly. So that's bigger than I would have guessed, right? One, if one was my original goal, I'm revising up now, or I'll just abort down. I'll say, you know what? This isn't going to, that's, that's, that, that, that's a weird word to, to use to describe this. It's yeah, a weird word. Well, you know, eject maybe is the, the better way to say it. I will, I will just eject out of, uh, you know, the plane. If I feel like, you know what, now that we have given it every throw and everything we've got at this, and we've learned new things. We have new information that tells us that this, is, this isn't going to work. Rather than compromising down and getting stuck on something we're not even really excited about, if we're no longer excited about it, I'll just, I'll change the goal completely or I'll leave the goal aside. I'll just go do something else because um, the new information has kind of shown me something to, to, it's just a check to say, don't just continuously dial it down because that's very tempting to do. And it's very easy to slip into mediocrity. So I kind of by forcing myself with something harsh, which is, all right, would I just quit this? It's like so harsh that it forces me to like, no, stick with the real goal and find a way to make it happen or change, you know, based on what your new understanding of reality, change this completely. Don't just like take it down a notch and another notch and another notch and another notch. And now it's all of a sudden not even that special to be with. So those are, those are my how to hit goals. Those are, those are things I do to hit goals. I remember years ago, you, when we were just kind of trying to, we were coming up, trying to make it happen. You said that you go, I think $6 million is the number I need to feel financially like secure, or I don't remember what word, like stable or like that Actually I need to free. never work yeah. again. Free. Did that goal change as you got older? Do you, were you right or wrong about that goal? Um, I think I was right, but I was wrong in one key aspect. And I actually... I said it on the podcast early on and our friend Narendra DM me and he was like, you're hey, wrong. Uh, you're wrong. Six won't be like six is not enough for you. And yeah. I was like, well, I don't know. I like, I do the math. He's like, it's not enough. Like, you know, first of all, uh, maybe your target return of what you think you're going to make on that six, you know, as you're, cause the, the idea is if you have a certain amount of money invested, what can you, and it's going to earn, you know, it's going to compound at some rate, 5%, 7% a year, whatever it is. Um, could you live off of that compound interest rather than, and the principal would never go down. You would never have to withdraw lower than the principal. So you would, you'd be financially free. You don't need new net income coming in because the money you have is working for your money now and you don't have to go work for your money. And you thought that was That's six. The, I thought it was six. Cause I had done some what calculations. Do you think now? Like, okay. Uh, um, now I think the number is like the real number is probably closer to 10 or 11. And, um, the aspirational number is like 25 and up because then it's like, oh, it's not even close at that point. So um, the reason why I'm bringing that up is the interesting thing about goals is I used to think if I if I achieve this thing, whether it's financial or body or whatever, that like I'm going to be changed. And I realized that pretty much across the board, every goal that I achieve, I'm like, oh, this was not as cool as I thought. I'm going to create a harder <laughs> one. And at first I was bummed, but now I'm like, oh no, that's not like, cause it's, it's just the chase. Like I'm born to hunt. You know what I mean? Like I have to chase a goal and I have to accept that when I hit my goal, it's not going to change much. It's just going to be a cool benchmark to go to the next one. And for, so with goal setting lately or the last couple of years, I've been like, oh, but just know that this isn't going to change anything, but it will be exciting to, uh, chase after it. And so that's what right. I, that's an interesting thing that I've learned a little bit with, as I've gotten older with goals. Yeah, and you know specifically I mean? with financial goals, your lifestyle creeps up. So like before when I did the, let's say 6 million number, I was like, all right, 6 million. If I earn 5%, if I'm getting 5%, let's say they, I think the S&P like kind of average, you know, uh, return is 8% or something like that. I was like, okay, let's say I can get five. Um, what would be, you know, that's 300K a year. Cool. At the time, I think I was spending under 200K a year in my burn. I was like, oh, that's good. And I have like, you know, 30% buffer. 
Well, now I spend, I think, more than that. And so because lifestyle creeps up, it's like, you know, I started to pay for more stuff. I started to buy more things. I started to travel a little bit differently, started to do all the things that people do. And now you didn't travel differently. You don't you just don't travel. <laughs> but when I do, I travel a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, the, the point is lifestyle creeps up. And so um, I think that's the thing you have to do if you're if you're not trying to be really disciplined in your lifestyle, which I'm not. I, I think life is to be enjoyed and I want to enjoy it to the fullest extent I, I know. And so as I learn new things, new ways to enjoy, I want to do those things and not feel limited by money. Um, I think you got to account for that. And you got to like over buffer. Are but, you looking to buy a house now? I'm looking at either buying or renting a new house. Yeah. Dude, renting is so awesome. I've been loving renting, man. Don't buy. Me too. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sick. The only downside with renting is just like, sometimes you don't, there's not enough inventory for like, uh, that is a big what you downside. want when you're in the burbs, but like, if you're patient, you could just, you can find it. Um, and right now, uh, the market seems to be, at least where I'm at in California and Bay area, the market seems to be moving where everything's getting marked down. So everything's down 20, 30%. Um, except for stubborn sellers who haven't realized yet that they need to mark down. And then even those aren't getting offers. And then they're pulling their thing off the market because they're like, okay, it's not selling. Now this just looks bad. And they're like switching to, okay, we'll rent this or we'll just stay in it or whatever. Like the market is very quick, quickly turning here um, to like a buyer's market is what I'm kind of seeing. Hmm. All right. I have something interesting to, to share with you. Have you heard of this company called Woot? W-O-O-T? Of course, yeah. Woot was like a, an internet staple, OG staple. It was one of the cool websites where it was like, you'd go and there was a daily deal. It's like, buy this TV for like $22 or something. So Ethan Brooks at The Hustle kind of told me about it, but I had read about it for a bit because the founder interests me. He's this, he's this guy named Matt Rutledge. And Woot was like, like you said, one of the original like daily deal sites. And it was acquired by Amazon. And the story is really interesting. I remember reading this a couple of years ago. So Matt Rutledge is this guy from Dallas and he flies up to uh, Seattle to meet with Bezos, like, uh, you know, right when it closes and they get a Sunday breakfast and they're like, Rutledge, he wrote, he's like, Bezos had like a weird energy this whole time, but whatever, I'm sitting in this meal. And I finally just say, so Jeff, why did you buy Woot? And Jeff like um, had just ordered breakfast and they have the, the meals in front of them. And he looks down at the meal. Then he looks at Matt and like 15 seconds passes. And Matt's like, should I just like ask him if he wants to like move on? And we just like skip this. And Jeff looks down at his meal again and then looks back up at Rutledge and he goes, you see, um, you're the octopus that I'm having for breakfast right now. Because Jeff had just ordered like eggs and octopus for some reason, like a <laughs> weird ass breakfast. <laughs> and he goes, when I look at the menu, you're the thing that I just don't understand. Basically, he had never ordered an octopus for breakfast before. And he's like, this is weird. I'm going to order it. I've never seen it before. I don't get it. I'm going to order it. You are the thing that I've never had. And I must have for breakfast the octopus. And that's why he said he bought this guy's company. <laughs> and this Rutledge guy was like, dude, you're fucking insane. Like, he didn't think about it. Like, it, like it, it, my takeaway was Rutledge was that not like, oh, you're a fake <laughs> story. That is a fake story story you either just made that up or no Matt i read it in an up, article those Ethan are quotes made it up. that is too those are direct quotes. hilarious to be that is too hilarious to be real the exact quotes I mean, that here. Is this incredible is, this is this is i'm gonna read it ver verbatim from the article and this is matt in rutledge saying telling the reporter you're the octopus that i'm having for breakfast when i look <laughs> at the menu you're the thing that i just don't understand the thing i've never had and i must have breakfast octopus and he just and he and that was like like a 20 <laughs> seconds pause for him to say that, like just like this fucking weirdo, like, you know, like Star Trek type of guy. And uh, as you would expect, as one would Dude, expect from uh, what there have been many great stories on this podcast, many great stories, thousands of great stories, I might say. This was the greatest story I've ever heard on this podcast. First of all, you told it great. I didn't know where you were going with this. The breakfast, the looking down, the looking up, the 15 seconds. And then that line is all time weirdo. That is so weird of a thing. To but just, what do you expect? <laughs> what do you expect? I was actually, I did a podcast the other day with someone and they asked me about my successful friends and like, what do they all have in common? I was like, well, they all like work hard. They all like are smart, but they're all fucking weird. They're all weird. And like everyone I know who's successful is pretty fucking weird. So who do you know that would say that line, by the way? That, not that line, world? no one, no one. But that guy's that, like, 
Bezos is like the weirdest of the weird. The maybe Moyes. Of the, maybe Moyes, Moyes might be the yeah. only guy. <laughs> yeah, like I've heard him say like, yeah, like your business is one Google away from me destroying you. Like he says stuff like that. But this guy says, I must have the breakfast octopus. But this company, Woot, it's really interesting because it's basically just a daily deal site, whatever. And like Matt is like, he said... Amazon ruined it, as you'd expect. And like, but they did all this funny stuff. Like they would sell a daily deal and the deals that they didn't sell, they would create this feature called the bag of crap, which is a, 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 a thing that like users would just buy blindly. And in the FAQs, it says like, well, if you don't like it, just list it on eBay, but we don't take refunds. And um, anyway, he leaves and he starts another thing and he calls it the me uh, a mediocre corporation. That's originally what it's called. And the... Uh, <laughs> And the underlying premise is that we're building a store that you don't need to buy anything to have fun. So like their copy is really, really good. And he basically said in an article, he was like, um, I want everyone's expectations to be incredibly low with this business. So that's why we call it a mediocre corporation. And it's pretty hilarious. And I was reading their copy. And so now uh, a mediocre cor corporation, they basically own like eight different websites. So um, and they're all like daily deal sites and all of them have like 350 to $2 million, uh, 2 million visits a month. So I bet you there, it's actually a pretty substantial business. And if you read the copy, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's wonderful copy. And I was thinking about this, the, the basically as I've sold my company to a big company, I've realized that basically for the longest time, I thought basically the only thing that a startup has that's better than a big company and why a startup can win is like focus. We could focus harder on stuff and we can move faster so we can move fast and have more focus and then i started reading about this guy and i started thinking about like the hustle and, like what made it interesting and the second and the third thing that i've add is that basically be, because there's less bureaucracy you can have more soul you can do more funny interesting stuff and the reason you can is basically the founder comes up with something says like we're just going to do it whereas at a big company there's like middle management and they're like i don't want to lose my job so i'm not taking this risk i'm not going to pitch the bag of crap like feature, even though that's hilarious and users love it. I ain't pitching it. I am gonna, I'm not going to do it. And I'll give you a good example. So I love AppSumo. AppSumo was started by my friend Noah Kagan and uh, no Neville uh, Maduro is my good, my best friend. And he like uh, helped run it. And it was a daily deal site as well. Listen to this copy. So they ran a deal one time where you could purchase like fonts. I don't know how you buy fonts, but that was the thing. Listen to the opening uh, paragraph from the daily email that he sent out. Neville wrote this. If the names Lusanda Sands Unico, Unicode or Cor Courier New don't mean anything to you, go ahead and close this message. You see, my friend, today we're reaching out to the community of people known as font whores. You know who you are. If your knees go weak when I whisper Garamond, you might be one. You might be one of them. <laughs> and I read this. I remember so I read good. this years ago before I met Neville. And I was like, this is this is beauty. This is beautiful. This turns off the people who you want to be turned off. And it gets, you know, the people who you want it. And I was just like in my head, I'm like. Dude, you're writing about having sex with this font. That is so funny. That is awesome. You are making the most boring topic really cool. And you cannot do that at a big company. It's incredibly hard. And it's not hard because the company's bad or good. It's just that's the rules of the game. And it's just like you're playing, you know, the game on hard mode if you're trying to like make a big company cute. And I was just thinking, this is just this company Woo. It's just such a perfect example. You should go to some of their websites. They're they're uh, they're the mediocre corporation. They own Casemates, uh, Mediocrity. That's one of their things. They own this site called Meh.com, Side Deal, Morning Save, and it's just deals. And I thought it was interesting. And the copy is hilarious. And this is and I've been thinking about businesses that you can build, which you are building, and I did where it's just like one or two people can kind of be the tastemakers and that can scale and be leveraged really nicely, kind of like a daily email. You know what I mean? But as you get bigger, you, it, you can't be able to do it all. It's going to get worse and worse. And I think that's just what's going to happen. Yeah, totally. By the way, their domain is mediocre.com, which is an amazing domain to have. Uh, this is such a cool story. I love that. And I love that, that email by Neville. That's uh, amazing copy. The, um, I think it's so true. Personality personalities you said soul i would say personality because it's we'll call like it personality interact yeah. with it is such a differentiator in life in all aspects of life but it, it also works in business people go into business assuming you have to play some role you have to like put on this suit and tie and be some character and all you're doing is simply blending in with every other suit and tie that exists out there and so they'll like i see this all the time founders will try to play the same game as the companies they admire the big companies, the successful companies, they assume because they're successful, 
that I need to act like them if I too want to be successful. What they forget was that before they were successful early on, the way they got successful was through having personality, having a point of view, having some edges to them. And those edges, they keep some people away because it's too rough for them. It's not what they wanted. And for other people, they're like, wow, this is the handle I need to grab onto because I love this. And so, you know, before Apple was Apple, they were, you know, the homebrew, they were at the homebrew computer club, right? They were basically, they had the two advantages you talked about. You said focus, I call it freakishly obsessive. And I use that word specifically because they are obsessed with that some topic, whatever it is. It could be Raspberry Pis, it could be blockchains, it could be whatever. They're usually obsessed with something that's not mainstream, because um, not that fun to be obsessed with something that's already totally mainstream. Mm -hmm. There's not there's not much joy in that for this person. And the second is that they're freakishly obsessed, which is not only just an extreme form of obsession, but they're they're willing to go to a length that other people wouldn't, and they're willing to like the topic is usually niche and weird. Um, so you know. Fonts is a good example of one of one um, of things like that. Then the other part that you mentioned, which is personality, it just gets squashed out of a big company. Because imagine if the at the beginning, when you're one or two people, the personality of the company is basically the personality of the founder or founders. And, okay, and it's typically like a room people. of people and they're like one upping each other. It's like, haha, that's they're funny. You're like, all right, but check this out. What if we even went even harder? Like, you know, like you have that like vibe because you're incentivized to do that. You want to grow. You want to do interesting stuff. Totally. You're not and incentivized the once the company gets bigger. Imagine a room, imagine a room of of one person. Okay. It's just that per whatever that person thinks is normal to them. You get two people, two co-founders. Maybe they're both a little bit weird. And so they riff off, off each other. It gets going. Now you add the third wheel. Even if that third wheel was totally vanilla, they're a total normal person. They're now outnumbered. So they join the thing and they're like, all right, I guess that's how we get down here. Right. You had a phrase. You go, you need to let your freak flag fly if you're going to work here. And so yeah. you, whoever came in, you indoctrinated them into your weird culture to do weird shit and do cool shit. And that was normal there. So the third person comes in, even if they're vanilla, all of a sudden they become flavored too. The fourth person comes in, same thing. But at some point, the next, like, I don't know where it is, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 people, somewhere in that range, I would say between 15 and 50 people. The person who gets hired typically will spend most of their time not with the founders anymore. And so now they're now one vanilla person is spending time with a bunch of other vanilla people and they're hiring other people who have a greater and greater percentage of vanilla, right? It starts with, they need to be 25, 30% because, hey, we need to be serious and get stuff done around here. Then you start hiring 50% vanilla. And by the time, you know, you get to 50 or hundred people, you're hiring a hundred percent vanilla people. And those people now, when they, someone says a weird idea, it's crickets in the room. It's risks come first. It's reasons why not rather than why we would. It's oh yeah, that has this one extreme strength, but it might have some other extreme weaknesses. So don't take the risk. That's going to offend it. certain people or that's going to like cannibalize yeah. this thing or that thing. Or yeah, it's just like bullshit excuses. Right. What will they say? What will they think? And so what will they say? But what really what it comes down to, it comes down to, I've got a good gig. I don't want to fuck it up. Uh, let's not, sh let's not rattle this. You know, I don't want to shake this up. Yeah, exactly. And, and I'm not comfortable shaking it up because I don't know that that's what we do here. Because a lot of time has passed. I, ha I don't hang out with the people who that are like totally high conviction of being weird. And um, and yeah, like I, I, I have some, I have more to lose than I have to gain by doing this, because when I say this idea, I don't get respect in the room. I get sort of like strange glances and nervous laughter. And then, you know, somebody tells me why my idea is a bad idea. So I learn to just keep that shit piped down. My freak flag is now you know, buried at the bottom of my trunk and it, you know, it's folded up and it's in its case. And so that's what happens at the, at the end of these companies. Now, some companies fight that off. So for example, this is why I think a lot of people like founder led companies because they keep that soul. They have one person in the company who has What's the gravitas. Example? So like, I, I think, I think this ha happened at, at uh, Tesla and it happened at, at, at Elon's companies. He is so publicly weird and big thinking and out there and willing to just go with it. That he kind of sets the tone, even if you don't on a day to day ever have meetings with Elon or work with him or you don't get the culture from him inside the company, you get you it from see it, seeing yeah. what he does on Twitter. So he kind of did you see his new butthole feature? Yeah, exactly. And so now if you're at Tesla, you're like, OK, the, the boss's 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 boss likes that weird shit and it gets a bunch of play on Twitter. And we've seen five things pay off by going overboard. Like, does a Cybertruck window really need to be bulletproof? No, but 
Elon would think that's fucking cool. So we're going to do it. And I know Elon thinks it's going to be cool because he lets the flag fly on Twitter. And so I see it even though I don't interact with him day to day. So that's one way to scale that personality is to have a such a strong personality and do it on blast. Another version, I remember when I was at Dude, Twitch. Dude, but he's got to put up with so much shit for that. And it's actually to be in his position. I've been in this position and I've like weakened out a bunch of times where I'm like, oh, fine. I'll let you guys get your way this time. Like, you know, like you're yeah. going to quit if I don't give it to this. Fine. I'll let you have it this time. And in my head, I'm like, but this is the wrong decision. But I'm only make I'm only agreeing to go with this, even though I don't like it, because like I don't want them to quit. And like, I just don't want this headache right now. Whereas right. he's the type of guy because he's like, you know, like on the spectrum, he's like, no, I don't like pick up on this social cue. Like we are not doing it. Like we're, this is fine. I'm okay being uncomfortable here. You know what I'm saying? Right. And that's, uh, totally. that's how I'm inspired by him a little bit. The belief in himself and also just the lack of self-awareness uh, is, is important there, right? You can't be like us. You can't be a self-aware wolf and just yeah. have too much self-awareness. <laughs> Like you have to have a little bit of like, you know, you know, you don't give a fuck in your system in order to do this. Well, at Twitch, one thing happened. I remember that I was like super, super proud to like be there working there at the time. I was like, cause I gave it a lot of shit. You know, I just do the sort of like the, the stereotypical startup guy thing where you're like, huh, startup, cool, big company, dumb, big company, slow, big company, boring, big company, no risk, big company, no innovation, right? Like it's the startup caveman who's just like, you know, like, um, you know, small startup, good, even though small startup is like failing and has no money and like no users, no, no impact, no nothing. It's like still in our head. There's like something to be really proud of there. But sometimes at these companies, some really cool shit happens. And one, I remember one was they released this campaign for Prime Day. So Twitch gets bought by Amazon. Amazon wants all of the Amazon companies to really push Prime Day. It's the like, it's basically its own Black Friday that they created, where it's like, yo, here's an excuse to go spend a bunch of money that you otherwise weren't going to spend. And Prime Day is huge for, for Amazon. So they, you know, the memo comes down, Twitch, you need to support Prime Day. And then everyone's at Twitch is like, shit, what do we do? And Twitch has a user base that is so easily offended. It's like, Anything Twitch does, any policy it creates, it's like, hey, we're um, increasing, you know, the safety and uh, for women. It's like, why? Because women can't defend themselves. It's like, dude, we're like, we're just trying to help. Like, we're not trying to offend anybody yeah. every step of the way, but you could sort of do no right. And um, so, so so people were just like, dude, what are we going to do? How are we going to promote this like Amazon Prime go buy shit stuff? Like people are going to think we're just total sellouts. Like this is not going to be cool. So what it's they not going to be go over well. So I don't know who the genius is in this company, but somebody was like, like, imagine like a TV show where they're like, God, like everyone's think we're just a sellout. Everyone's think it's just a sellout. And then you get cue the dream music. It's like, sell out, sell out. I got it. Twitch sells out. And they made it, a, yeah. a, they like turned it on its head and they went self-aware, you know, like, in, and it's always sunny. It's like the gang, you know, the gang goes to a Trump rally or whatever. It's like the, it, the event was come watch how hard Twitch will sell out today. And they basically leaned into it completely instead of trying to do it and then sort of like set themselves up to catch a bunch of arrows from fan from the, the users who were like, God, stop trying to promote Prime Day. This is annoying. Like, this is why it was this is why I didn't want Amazon to buy Twitch. Like it, I knew it was just going to sell out to this corporation. I call that so the instead, eight mile strategy. Have you seen eight mile? Yes, exactly. Like the, the there's this scene. one, like the last scene, Eminem's like, yeah, I am white. Yeah, I am poor. Yeah, this did it. This guy did have sex with my mom. Yeah, this all <laughs> happened. And then it, it like he makes it entertaining. And then the other guys are like, well, fuck, I can't make fun He's of him speechless. about that. Anymore. Yeah, right. like I can't I can't mock that. You you just took it away from me. You know what I mean? Right. I'm powerless <laughs> here. I, it's the eight mile strategy. And I love it. That, that's exactly what it is. And so, yeah, they went full Slim Shady. They basically, what they did was they created a QVC style set, right? Like the cheesiest, salesiest set. And then they invited the big streamers and it was like, they created this like ne this neon 80s logo that was like, Twitch sells out. And then the people would jog onto the stage. They'd be like, today I'm going to sell you this shitty blender. And they like, <laughs> and, they would just, and people found it so entertaining and it was funny and it was self-aware and they... They just like, and it sold like crazy. Like it was so successful. And I don't know who this was. It was somebody in like the creative marketing department. Um, I think I met them at one point, but I was like, Hey, you don't know this, but like, that was the number one thing I respected, you know, that we did like, of all the features we shipped of all the projects we tried. That was my favorite. It was my number one. I thought that was so well done. Whoever That's came badass. up with that, you had guts, you had creativity and you like turned a disadvantage into an advantage, which is like, for me, 
that's the highest form of respect. When I see somebody who can take a disadvantage and flip it to an advantage, it's like, that's, you're my person. You are, you are everything that's right about business in my book. I love that. I'm going to look that up. I want to see, uh, I want to, I like, I want to see the content. I bet it's hilarious. It's good. It was really well done. We need to come up with a better way to end the show. If we're going to come up with a way to start it, we have to come up with a... <laughs> yeah. Hey, just sort before of you guys fade. end, Sean, you, you never talked about the basketball game. Oh, yeah. You got to talk about that. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, let's do it. I, I got to be a little vague about it, but yeah, let's do it. You guys saw... So I sent you guys the guest list for this thing. Um, I guess I should explain what it is. So, so I went to that'd a be, conference. That'd be smart, yeah. <laughs> I went to a conference... And it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, but I don't know about you, but I have this like feeling before I go to a conference, which is like there's like a 48 hour period before where I'm like, what are why all the I reasons I could not go to do this? Yeah, yeah. What are the reasons I could get out of this? And I don't know why that urge comes over me. I think like just the idea in my head of what a conference entails is like this stuffy ballroom, like awkward handshake conversations with people who like, you know, nobody knows each other. And it's just like it's like just like the worst first day of college all over again every day in my you know in my professional life now and so i was like yeah i just hate that feeling and i hate conferences but like there is some magic at conferences that happens or you know i do like meeting new people i do like learning new things um and i do like some of the like little side events that happen in a conference that are like not the speaker on the stage and not the like networking mixer where i have to like go barge in be like, hey, what are you guys talking about Oh, you yeah. guys known each other for yeah. 10 years? Cool. Well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Sean. I have a, you guys like podcasts? <laughs> just like, you know, oh, you don't you recognize like me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I was just asking if you guys knew where the bathroom was. I was just waiting this whole time to barge in and ask that. I'm going to go now. See ya. So, Dude, uh, by the so way, the, the best, the best way to approach that I've learned is just saying, Hey, I don't know anyone here. Can I join your conversation? <laughs> I've noticed yeah, that to be just the best. It's it's the upfront <laughs> method. Um, yeah, exactly. So so I dislike conferences for that reason. And I was like, all right. Um, and and at the same time, I'm like, dude, I miss doing some stuff that was really fun that I just don't make a lot of time for nowadays. I was like, I miss just playing basketball. Just like, dude, I used to play three hours a day. Just pick up was just, it was so fun. That was like the best time, just me and my friends and just playing. And you know, we used to meet a bunch of cool people doing that. And so I was talking to Ben and I was like, not producer Ben, but business partner Ben. I was like, I was like, dude, what if, could we get like the magic of a conference to combine with the magic of like just going play, playing pickup? Like, is there a way to do this? And he's like, yeah, I got an idea. And so we came up with this idea, which was we have a friend who trains some of the biggest like NBA stars and he's been training them for years. And like, these are like, you know, all-star hall of fame level, level players. And, um, he's their personal trainer. Like he'll go to their house and work with them every day in the summer and that thing, things like that. And, uh, we've become friendly with him, uh, because he's a, he's an entrepreneur and we've, we got to know him that way and kind of helping each other out with our businesses. And so we were like, yo, um, his name's Alex Basil. We're like, Alex, you know, you train Kyrie Irving, you train Trey young, you train Carmelo Anthony, you train these guys. Like, dude, what if I just got a bunch of business dorks together who all love basketball? And like, would you just train us like you train them like a fantasy camp? Like, can we just pretend for a weekend? Like we are, we're those guys. And he's like, yeah, I'm down. Like just, you know, pick a weekend as long as I'm free. Like we'll do it. And I was like, okay. And then I was like, once I had one side of it and I was like, all right, so let's, what if we just got like 10, 12 people who were, you need your anchor though. You need your whale. And we needed our whale. And I was like, how do I get people to come to this? I was like, first of all, I don't even know who plays basketball, who doesn't. I was like, who would I want to, who's like, number one, a great hang. Number two, loves basketball. And number three, like successful enough in business where if I go invite the next person, the pull is that these other people are coming, right? right. That's the key to any great event is these other people are going to be there. The people are the event. N that way I don't have to be like great with the food and Bev and like the environment. I have all these logistics I'm not good at. Like the people are the event. As long as the people are there to work. And so, uh, um, I won't say who, but we landed one big whale, famous person X, and then the domino started world falls famous, off. world famous, mainstream famous yeah, like, type of person. Not, exactly. So mainstream famous type person. And then I was like, okay, cool. And I started to get a couple of friends in and then I sent you the guest list because you're coming. Yeah. And producer Ben is coming. 
and, or like I told you guys to come. I don't know if you guys are or not coming, but you should come. It'll be fun. When's the date? Did you say the date? It's next month or it's in 20 days. So it's 20 days from now. Um, but you saw that guest list, dude, it's coming together. There's some pretty awesome people going now. And now it's way bigger than like 10 people. Like we got 20 people and this is like, how many, oh, how big person, do you want it to be? Their dad owns this NBA team and this person, they just sold their company for all this money. And then this person, they're the CEO of this publicly traded company. It's like, I didn't even know that guy likes to play. You know, like there's a whole bunch of really interesting people. I think this is going to be dope. And I think this is a I way be better awesome. way. I think this is a hack where I don't have to go attend conferences. I get to host. Dude, the party. You should invite a uh, Lori uh, jet.com. I should invite him. Yeah, I haven't invited him yet. That's a good he, one. I don't know if, if he plays. He, don't, I mean, he owns, he owns a basketball team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah like, he's I awesome. Know. I will invite him. Um, but yeah, what do you think about this? This is awesome. It's going to be the best. I think it's going to be really fun. I think you should invite even bigger, more famous people than just like internet dorks. Like Mark would be cool or uh, I don't know who else. Uh, that's actually the hard part is to think about who to invite. But yeah, it's going to be awesome. I think it's going to be really fun. I think it's a great idea. I think making yourself the center of these types of things is is badass. It's a net win. There's no downside. Right. Are you this out of pocket the, any money? Um, I don't know. I haven't even thought about cost yet. But like, yeah, like uh, it'll cost money to do this, but it's not going to be super crazy. And I think, every, I think everyone, everyone would pitch, pitch in. Everyone would pitch in. Just uh, nobody's, We're not trying to make a profit off this thing. We're just trying to like, you know, cover all the costs and do, make it dope. No, I think uh, it's a great would, idea. Would be the goal. Um, and it would be, so yeah, it's going to look sick on social. Like it's work related. Which, uh, let's, uh, let's tell uh, daddy HubSpot to pay for it. <laughs> hey fellas. Um, quick break between, between games here. Just want to quickly talk to you guys about your CRM needs. <laughs> They'll be into it. I think they're trying to if appeal everyone to just like, gather around. I have a quick PowerPoint that I'd love to just run you through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, already I, I think they would. <laughs> but no, make them pay for it. If we can record, yeah. Well, oh, that's we only a good need idea. to record. One, think we only that. need to we record, record one or two things. We should record. Uh, we, each day, we could probably record two or three like things. We could even have like two people on at a time so it's not like uh, dude and we should get couches and have people playing in the background <laughs> yeah the game is just running in the background There's, the audio sucks it's just so much like screaming from basketball the full send guys did a uh the full send guys they had a wedding i think it was like post malone's manager or some some like famous -y person was doing a wedding and they set up a studio off to the side of the reception area and they were That's in cool. there recording a podcast for an hour and like Logan Paul popped in for like 10 minutes and this other person popped in for like five minutes and it was really cool. It was a great pod. We should do something. And they're like, all right, you guys want to go back? Like, I think dessert's at our table. And they like went back. <laughs> it, it was that pretty a awesome. great idea. <laughs> yeah, it was a really good. It was like, if, if you explained it to me, I was like, oh, this isn't cool. But I saw them pull it off and I was like, oh, this is actually really neat. We should totally do that and ask HubSpot to uh, front the bill. All right, great. All right, done. Done. All right, well. Good idea. That's the pod. That was a good one.